Palisade Radio is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. I'm back for more insights from a legend in the business. We have with us Rick Rule for our Palisade Sprott monthly market update. Rick, welcome back to the program. Colin, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I can imagine work is moving at a furious pace in your world, pre- preparing for what's going to be a great conference, the Sprott Vancouver Natural Resource Symposium, which is July 26th until the 29th. Couple that with markets simply not slowing down, and your plate must be rather full. Uh, Rick, you've got a celebrity set of speakers at the show, some of Canada's best resource companies in attendance, and of course, great investment crowd showing up. Um, I don't want to provide a shameless plug here, but we'll be in attendance from the 26th to the 29th. What can you tell us about the show? Well, Colin, first of all, we accept shameless plugs. Thank you for that. And we uh, we look forward to having you there. I, I think one of the things that separates our uh, conference from other conferences is, first of all, uh, this is its 25th year in existence. It stood the test of time. We think it's stood the test of time because we've always had a great group of headline speakers. This year, of course, uh, our featured speaker will be Jim Rickards, who made that spectacular call on gold 18 months ago and has built a 30,000 subscriber uh, uh, gold investment letter as a consequence of that. I think the other thing that really sets our conference apart is the fact that our attendees over 25 years have told us that they consider our exhibitors to be content, too. At most other conferences, the exhibitors are regarded as advertisers. And if you show up with a pulse and to check that cash is, by the way, in reverse order of importance, you're admitted. Uh, What we have learned is that our attendees consider our exhibitors to be opportunities and, in fact, content. And so we've taken a different approach. Uh, Any public company that you see exhibiting at the Sprott Conference will be a company that is owned by Sprott. Now, that doesn't guarantee that every stock will go up, but it does guarantee that we know the companies well enough that we have put our money where our mouth is, a sort of an implicit endorsement from the podium. And that uh, that technique has really stood the test of time. It's interesting that although the conference itself is a high-end retail conference, you will have representatives from the largest gold mining companies in the world. You will have representatives from a couple sovereign uh, countries. You will have representatives from the World Bank and the IFC. Uh, So it's going to be a a conference where the content is sufficient to attract the biggest sovereign and institutional investors in the world, but in a format which is suitable for the high high net worth retail investor. Leading up to the conference, you've been quoted as saying you're preparing for what you believe to be the greatest shift in natural resource markets that you'll likely see in your career. Quite a bold statement considering the successes you've had in the bull markets of the past. How do you substantiate such a claim? Well, I think in fairness, in the, re- in the remaining part of my career, um, I came into the career uh, at your age <laughs> in the 1970s bull market, uh, which was truly a spectacular shift, a shift towards resources after a 50-year period in which the economy wasn't attracted to resources. But I suspect that the next five years will be much more generous to the junior resource space in particular than people give it credit for being. You know, Colin, we have a uh, junior precious metals market, which is up about 100% in a very short period of time. And people say, how can it go so far so fast? Well, as we discussed on your show about six months ago, this is a market that had fallen by 90%. So think about the arithmetic. A market that's off by 90% that raises by a hundred, that goes up by 100% is now sold off by 80%. That's how far it can go. Will it go there all at once? Of course not. But what you're going to see at some point in time in the future, Colin, and this is very exciting, is you're going to see the gold price move in U.S. dollar terms, which you see very rarely. The last time we saw it was 2002. The other thing that you're going to see 18 months to two years from now will be a synchronized bull market where the precious metals run, but other commodities run too. Not Not because of demand, but in fact because of supply destruction. And those types of markets are extremely volatile to the upside. Again, we point back to 2002 where the supply destruction that we saw in the decade of the 90s 
gave rise to the stratospheric increases in commodities prices that we saw at the beginning of the last decade. Past will be prologue in this case. Well, like you just mentioned, we haven't had a reasonable pullback yet. It's been about six months that we've been moving up, a hundred percent move so far. But this is not necessarily abnormal in the starting phase of a rebound. Some historic charts show, like the 2008 recovery, uh, that you had about 12 to 14 months before you saw a 15 to 20 percent retracement, which begs the question: How much of a risk is there for investors to wait on the sidelines right now? Well, the, the, I guess there are two questions. Uh, for those who are, are waiting on the sidelines, uh, particularly for those who don't own physical precious metals, that's a mistake. Um, the other risk is, in fact, the, the market has given us so much so fast it's becoming frothy. Now, the truth is, in a few of my positions where I'm up 200, 300 percent, I'm pulling money out. I'm going to the point of no concern. If you have a half a million dollar position that suddenly become a $2 million position, you're very wise, I think, to sell $500,000 worth of stock, even knowing that it will likely go higher. If you take away all of my downside, Colin, you can have some of my upside. So people need to remember to sell. For new customers coming into the business, and we have a lot of them coming in right now, uh, people who have been interested in the gold narrative but haven't had the courage to participate until they got the price signals, what we are doing with those people is we're putting them in a lower risk basket. The basket involves physical precious metals, in our case represented by the New York Stock Exchange traded Sprott Physical Tr Precious Metals Trusts, gold, silver, and platinum and palladium respectively. And we're putting them in uh, two ETF products, the Sprott Gold Miners Index uh, ETF, SGDM, and the Sprott Junior Gold Miners ETF. The reason that we're using the ETFs rather than individual stocks is that we want to give people a low-fee product that has diversity through the gold sector, but that also has enough liquidity that you can employ tight trailing stops. Uh, a 30% or a 35% retrenchment here wouldn't be unheard of. And if you can have the upside, but limit your downside to 10 or 12% of your holdings, we think that's an intelligent way to play the game. So we like the ETFs for the low fee aspect, for the product diversity, and also for the incredible liquidity that it offers. Rick, the Brexit vote that came just a couple weeks ago came as a market surprise to most participants, and the launch in the price of gold was quite dramatic. Uh, two questions here. Did the vote come as a surprise to yourself, and do you believe the effects of Brexit vote have already been seen in the gold price? Will it continue? The, uh, the vote did come as a surprise to me, although it shouldn't have. Uh, when I'm in Great Britain, I spend my time in London. The uh, London voter is young. Uh, educated, wealthy, and a beneficiary of Europe. The vote that uh, voted to leave were mostly not young, mostly not particularly educated, mostly not particularly successful, and in the British Midlands and the North. So in retrospect, the vote shouldn't have been a uh, particular surprise to me. It was my own fault, I think, that it was. With regards to the um, implications, uh, I think that the implications for the gradual devolvement of the European community are um, fairly scary. And I, I think there's probably $20 trillion in investment assets in Europe that will begin to look for another home. I think that that is probably bullish. I don't think. I know that it's bullish for precious metals. Ironically, I think it's probably bullish also for the U.S. dollar and U.S. equities. Uh, the great European experiment is certainly something that's not at an end. But it is something that's going to experience some turmoil for a while, and investors hate turmoil. Will that be good for gold? Yes. Uh, will it keep interest rates lower? Yes. Will it lead to even more quantitative easing or correctly described counterfeiting? Yes. Uh, ironically, as I say, it will probably benefit U.S. equities as well as precious metals. Well, that's something I was going to ask you about later in the interview, the U.S. equities. There was a bit of a cushion for junior resource investors six months ago when you had the Dow at an all-time high and these gold stocks at an all-time low. And you could make the argument that if you had a deflationary sell-off in the Dow, uh, you probably wouldn't lose too, too much in the resource sector because it was already so sold off. 
now you have these stocks up 100% and the Dow is still at an all-time high. Or would you start to get worried if this goes on for another year, uh, you know, if the Dow gets higher, that a crash in the Dow could cause one of those 2007, 2008 crashes in the juniors as well? Very prescient question for a young man, Colin, and I think the answer to that is yes. The truth is that gold stocks are stocks, and when stocks in general sell off, particularly when they sell off as a consequence of a liquidity event, um, the uh, effects of that are particularly pernicious in niche assets like gold stocks, uh, like small cap stocks. In precipitous sell-offs of the kind that we saw in 2008, the sell decisions are often not made by the investors, but rather by the margin clerk. And the margin clerk will hit what bids are available, including gold and gold stocks. So I, I think the question that you uh, that you ask is one that investors should consider. Uh, returning for a second to the U.S. stock market, if we assume that the global economic climate doesn't get dramatically worse and that U.S. interest rates go up, on the basis of enterprise value to EBITDA, the companies in the S&P 500 don't appear to be statistically overvalued. The problem is that that statement rests on two assumptions, that the economy doesn't get dramatically worse. I'm not an economist, and I can't say if it will or it won't, but investors need to ask themselves that question. The second question, of course, revolves around the interest rate, because one of the reasons that stocks are high is because their cost of capital, their borrowing cost, is low at the same time that the dividend yields of stocks become very competitive with bonds and also with um, deposit products. It would appear, uh, and partially because of Brexit, uh, and also partially because of a weak economy, that we are in for a period of prolonged artificially low interest rates, which would appear to be good for the S&P 500. Now, I need to disclaim everything I just said, Colin, uh, by saying that I am neither an economist nor a general securities analyst. I'm a relatively experienced investor and speculator who specializes, in fact, in natural resources. But the truth is that I think that the climate that we're involved in now, assuming my assumptions, decent economy, not a hard sell-off, and continued stabilized interest rates is probably good for U.S. equities. I received a call from a fund manager earlier, earlier this week whom we had had on the program in February, and he told our audience in February that while he liked gold, he was not quite convinced to jump in on the trade. I think his reasoning was after having missed the first month of the move, the risk as a trader was too high to jump in. On my call this week, he told me that gold's going to the moon. He wants to deploy tens of millions of dollars into the space with several excited expletives included. I want to ask you, are you seeing inflows of capital from people that were outside of the space yet, or is this still driven by the diehard gold bugs? No, we're seeing uh, flows into gold across the spectrum. In the largest and most liquid gold stocks, especially Barrick and Newmont, S&P 500 components, we're seeing generalist buying. Uh, we're seeing continued strong Canadian institutional support because the Canadian institutions are uh, still under owning gold. Most of the institutions are closet indexers, and the gold stocks in Canada are about 8% of the index. If you're a generalist and you aren't long, the only part of the index that move, that's moving, you have to get long. You have no second choice. At the same time we see that, we're seeing inflows of funds, it, pardon me, into the gold specialized funds. And the gold specialized funds are deploying the capital in the mid-cap and junior producer space. The punters, the speculators, the investors, people like you and me are beginning to take their profits in the second tier, uh, exiting those positions and leaving them to the gold funds, and we're deploying our capital in the junior. So you're seeing moves up across the spectrum. You're seeing very large flows of funds into every aspect of the place, including the senior gold stocks. Uh, pardon me, including the senior gold stocks and the physical precious metals. Uh, am I concerned about the frothiness of the trade? Absolutely. I also believe your institutional investor to be correct. In the near term, despite the fact that the, the market is frothy, stocks go up simply because there are more buyers than sellers. And this is as broadly a bid market as I have ever seen in my career. 
Rick Silver's played a game of catch up in short form this year. I believe it's up about 45% on the year so far. Do you see any driver that you can point out, or is this uh, is just something inevitable that typically happens where you have a reversion to uh, a normal ratio between gold and silver? Probably three answers to that. We're seeing a very strong retail gold demand from U.S. retail buyers, something that's been absent for the market for the last five years. The second thing that we're seeing is that the prolonged period of low silver prices has really taken a toll on primary silver producers, which is about 20% of new silver supply. The third thing is that the very soft zinc and copper prices are limiting byproduct production of silver. So we're beginning to see uh, tightness on the supply side of silver. The second thing that we see with regards to silver, however, is momentum. Silver has always been the poor man's gold. And the silver speculator, the, the, gold, the silver bug, if you will, is really a gold bug on steroids. And the, the whole sort of silver speculator mentality is, is coming into play here. So my suspicion is, although the silver stocks have kept, place with the, kept pace with the gold stocks, if the silver trade itself, the physical trade, begins to gather momentum, and if physical silver begins to outpace gold, which I suspect it might, I think you might see a real blow off top in the silver stocks. That's not a prediction. It's just something that people need to watch for. We haven't run any analysis on the amount of business mergers M&A in the mid tiers and even the juniors, but I suspect it seems like there's been a lot more activity the last few months. I want to ask you if that's a reflection on more fair valuations going into these stocks. Uh, is it time to start trading down from the, from the large cap and mid tier into developers and exploration? Where should money be deployed? I know that's a very difficult question to answer because there's a lot of risk associated to, to different ways of deploying the capital. I think for people who aren't prepared to spend 20 or 25 hours per month studying individual stocks, that there's too much risk in the mid-tier and in the juniors, and that people who want to participate in the up moves in those sectors would be better off spending the 20 hours per month in their profession. Uh, making money doing what they know how to do, and deploying their capital in the sector through the ETFs. Uh, that being said, there will be increased merger and acquisition activity, but I don't suspect myself that it will get silly for another couple of years. The reason for that, I think, is that uh, the industry is afraid that past is prologue. In that sense, the merger and acquisition activities that took place in the last decade were so destructive of capital and resulted in so many senior managers being thanked and excused, that's a polite way of saying fired, that I, I suspect that capital deployments, uh, meaning new mine investments, and also M&A, will be intelligent for the next two years, which is to say constrained. I think we'll get into, we'll get into you know, fully-fledged silly season 2018, 2019. But one of the reasons that I'm so attracted to this bull market is I suspect that the next 24 months, the management teams who, whose experience in the last market made them more prudent will prevail, and the increase in gold price in the company's margins won't be sullied by stupid investment decisions for at least two years. Rick, a couple more questions to ask you. I want to just quickly touch on platinum and palladium, which have been lagging the price of gold. Historically, platinum is, is higher than the price of gold for the most part, and it hasn't been that way for quite some time. Are you seeing uh, that platinum will likely race ahead and get ahead of gold as silver is catching up right now as well? We aren't seeing that occur, and I think the reason we aren't seeing that occur is very tough global economic conditions, despite the fact that the global automobile fleet is probably the oldest that it's ever been. And despite the fact that there's a uh, reasonable demand for automobiles and new car in markets like uh, India and China, the truth is that global consumption and global investment are very soft as a consequence of soft economic conditions. And that relates directly to platinum and palladium demand. The second thing that's happened in the platinum and palladium market is the extraordinary sell-off in the value of both the rand and the ruble has meant that the cost of producing platinum and palladium in the countries that produce it has fallen fairly precipitously. It's worth noting that about 60% of the world's supply of platinum and palladium is still, is still uneconomic on a fully loaded cost basis. But the truth is that the supply reckoning with regards to platinum and palladium 
uh, has been pushed back as a consequence of a 50% devaluation in the currencies in the countries that produce it. My suspicion is when the platinum and palladium market does get underway, that the price increases that holders of platinum and palladium will enjoy will outpace the price increases that you see in both gold and silver because of the uh, incredible pressures that you'll see on the supply side in those materials. The problem with that forecast, Colin, is that I can't tell you when. Rick, let's let's finish with one more metal. My two favorite metals are both yellow, gold probably being number one right now, and uranium being number two. We've started deploying quite a bit of capital into some select uranium juniors over the past couple months. And like you know better than anybody, when uranium moves, if you're not in, you're out. Is it time to deploy or you still think there could be a couple years left before the move? Funny you uh, mentioned that, Colin. I have been uh, deploying some of my own capital back in the uranium space myself. My supposition is that the market doesn't move for a year and a half or two. Mar or two. Uh, that might be my uh, reacting to my own early entrance to the sector two years ago. But the truth is that worldwide demand for uranium is assured because of the efficiency with which uranium generates electricity and the need of some economies uh, to have uh, energy security. The truth is that uh, both the International Energy Agency and Cameco, the world's largest producers of uranium, believe that the industry needs $60 a pound U.S. to earn its cost of capital. So the way the situation works right now, Colin, is that you make the stuff for 60 bucks a pound, you sell it for $27 a pound, you lose $33 a pound and try and make it up on volume. That doesn't work. Now, of course, the contract market for uranium, that is the long-term sales price for uranium, is more like, 40, more like $44 or $45. But even at $45, the industry isn't earning its cost of capital. What really intrigues me about this, this market, Colin, is that the price of it has to go up. And when the price does go up, the benefit will be shared over a very small number of companies that are very, very closely held. So the ability for the market to give you genuinely astronomical increases in share prices is there. The third thing that I think people have to consider is that the last bull market in uranium stocks generated so much wealth and it happened so recently, only 12 years ago, that the experience that people enjoyed last time will cause them to be extremely aggressive participants this time. Everything that needs to be in place is in place for a truly incredible bull market. Again, the problem is that nobody can tell when this is going to occur. I am already positioned in the sector, and I am beginning to deepen my positions right now. But I'm a very patient speculator with a, a, a great tolerance for pain. People forget or do not realize just how big the gains can be. You just said the tightly held nature of these companies, how few there are. I remember energy fuels went up 45 times. I believe it was 2006. The share price went up 45 times in one year. And I love the gold space, but I just don't know if you can get those kind of returns that you get out of uranium. I, I don't think that anything else can give you the type of returns that you will see when the returns will be confined in the early stages to 10 or 12 names. Uh, if you think about a company that has some production, which is sort of nominally economic at $40, uh, you know, maybe they're getting $2 a pound uh, margin at $40. If the price goes to $60, although the price of uranium will have increased by 50%, the company's margins will go up tenfold, Colin. Uh, they're truly astronomical leverage in these stocks, and the leverage occurs over a very small uh, number of names. I'll, I'll give you an anecdote from the past bull market, which will tell people, dreamers, why they should participate. Early on in the last cycle, I identified something called Paladin Uranium as an interesting speculation. Very small company, closely held. We financed them at a dime, and we financed them again at 12 and a half cents. Uh, our genius, if you will, in other words, our poor timing, was rewarded by the stock decreasing from 12 and a half cents all the way to a penny, that is one cent. We had to finance it again at one and a half cents, and three years later, that stock was at $10. Now, 
from its bottom at a penny to its top at, at ten dollars the stock didn't increase a thousand percent it increased a thousand fold and that took place over three and a half years now that's the most uh, outrageous example that I can give but my supposition is that 10 baggers and 20 baggers that is stocks that go up a thousand and two thousand percent uh, will be relative to the number of stocks available to participate in the norm all right. Well, let's finish up there, Rick. I'd love to keep talking, but I know your schedule is busy. A reminder for all of our listeners that we've got the Sprott Vancouver Natural Resource Symposium, July 26th to the 29th. Feel free to shoot me an email, colin at palisadeglobal.com. I'll try to get you uh, some type of a discount rate or at least put you in touch with the right group there. Uh, Rick, thanks so much for coming back on the program. It's always a great time. Always a pleasure, Colin. Thank you for having me. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? 